Thank you for joining us here at Milligan Ridge Baptist Church for our online service today. Um, just so appreciative of this blessing that we have to be able to get the word out even in the midst of this pandemic when we're all social, uh, separating ourselves and locking ourselves in our homes and things like that. But we can still get the word of God out through this means. And I appreciate y'all taking time to listen, to tune in. And again, I ask you to do me a favor. If you would, just share this message on your Facebook page if you're watching. And just to continue to sow the seeds out there. And just because, like I said before, somebody who would never come to a church building may hear the word of God preached in their home on Facebook. And so yeah. uh, let's pray about that, okay? Every time we would get together here, we would always recognize birthdays. And I failed to do that the last couple of weeks. We've been doing online services, and I apologize if someone's had a birthday that I haven't mentioned. But this past week, we've had several birthdays. And so I want to uh, just mention those people to you this morning. Um, <laughs> last Sunday, Evan Dallas had a birthday. First, uh, happy birthday, Evan. Monday, Brett Carter celebrated a birthday, and also a week before, um, had a son born. So... I want to say happy birthday, Brett, and congratulations to him and Kaylee and baby Hudson. Tuesday was Betty Keller's birthday. Thursday, Michael Minton and Paige Minton celebrating a birthday. Friday was Lori Riney's birthday. And Saturday, Jacob Freeman turned 14 years old, so happy birthday, Jacob. And also, we had an anniversary this past week. Happy anniversary to Ronnie and Kathy Shortness that celebrated their anniversary uh, yesterday, April the 4th. Okay, and we, I've got an announcement to make, so I want to share this with you uh, to get ready for next Sunday. Next Sunday, we'll have a praise in the parking lot service. We've got the equipment we're going to set up on the front porch of the church here with speakers, and so you're encouraged, if you can, to come to church, but stay in your cars in the parking lot, roll the windows down, and just listen to the Word of God being preached on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, as I like to call it, uh, 11 o'clock. We'll keep it at the same time so we won't confuse anybody. So 11 o'clock, drive here to Milligan Ridge Baptist Church, park in the parking lot, and get ready to worship God there in your car, okay? Um, if you can't come for some reason, if you're too far away or maybe you're sick or, or whatever the reason might be that you can't physically be in the parking lot, just tune in again on Facebook. We'll stream it live from outside. So um, just get you prepared for next week's service, okay? All right. Well, our, our text this morning is found in the book of John, John chapter 12. And I'm going to read verses 12 through 19 this morning. And, and well, the title of the lesson is The Day the King Rode into Town. And what a day that must have been. Oh my goodness. When Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem for that final week of his life here on this earth. So let's look, if you've got your Bibles, at John chapter 12 and read verses 12 through 19. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass set thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's coat. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done those things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for, they, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive you how you prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Amen. Let's join together and pray to God this morning that he'll bless the reading of his word. Father, we come in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We just pray, God, that we can open our hearts and, 
and just allow your Holy Spirit to move and minister and convict. And God, as we read about this day so long ago, that our King rode into the city of Jerusalem. Help us, just help us to get excited about that, God, and what it means to us today. So Lord, I pray for everybody who is listening to this message being preached, Lord, just preach through me today and speak to the hearts of those people that are listening so that we can glorify you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I want you to try to do something with me this morning, if you will, as we think about this time, this day that the king rode into town on the donkey. Try to put yourself there in your mind. Try to, to sense the atmosphere surrounding that day and, and, and put yourself there as you see Jesus on the donkey riding by into the city and you, you're witnessing the, the celebration that's breaking out amongst all the people there in attendance. I'm going to tell you something. A lot of those folks there were probably uh, recipients of Jesus' healings at one time or another. Some of them that were there may have been blind and Jesus touched their eyes and gave them sight and now they're, they're witnessing him riding into town. Some of them may have been deaf and Jesus healed them and gave them their hearing back and they could hear the celebration going on. Some of them may have been mute and couldn't speak and Jesus gave them that ability back and healed them and now they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and praising his name. Some of them may have been lame, and Jesus healed them from that. And they were there jumping up and down, watching as he rode into town. You know, some of them may have been possessed by demons. And Jesus healed a lot of possessed people and cast those demons out. And now they were there in their right mind, worshiping him and praising his entry into the city of Jerusalem. There may have been some people that had been dead and Jesus raised from the dead. Lazarus was probably there just waving those palm branches as well. There are some people there in that crowd that may have tasted of the fish and the bread from that little boy's sack lunch as Jesus fed the multitude of 5,000 men plus women and children. Some of those there may have learned at the feet of Jesus as he taught people, as he sat on, and, and preached a sermon on the mount. Amen. There were a lot of people there that already knew Jesus, but there was probably some that came out of curiosity because they had witnessed the animosity building up between Jesus and the religious leaders, and, and they may have come just to see how it was going to boil over as the Jews gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But whatever reason they were there, it was a celebration. And they were waving palm branches and just jumping up and down and celebrating the arrival of Jesus. And they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. That's a word that means, uh, uh, it's an exclamation of adoration. And then they said who they thought Jesus was. They continued, they said, blessed is the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. So they were celebrating Palm Sunday, as we call it today, by waving the palm branches. I read a story about a little boy one time who was sick on Palm Sunday and couldn't go to church. And so his mom stayed home with him and dad took the rest of the family and went to church to worship on Palm Sunday. And when they got home, were, all the people had a palm branch with them. And, and the little boy was curious. He says, what are those that you got there? And Dad said, well, this is a palm branch. Everybody was waving them when Jesus passed by. And the little boy got angry. He says, wouldn't you know it? The one Sunday I missed and Jesus showed up. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. We can celebrate Jesus today, okay? Celebrate the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as the king rode into town. A lot went on during this week when Jesus made his entry into Jerusalem. When he got there, he cleansed the temple. We see that Jesus went in to the outer gates of the temple and they, were, they had turned it into a flea market. You know, they were buying and selling and, and the, the idea was why drag an animal for a long distance to the temple to offer as a sacrifice, just wait till you get here and buy one and take it to the priest. And so Jesus made a whip and he ran people out and kicked the tables over 
and, and you know, he was upset about that, but he cleansed the temple. And <clears throat> then, of course, he upset the religious leaders, but that wasn't anything new. But then he took his disciples out and began to teach them, and, and he took them to the Mount of Olives and, and taught what we know now as the Olivet Discourse. And so, you know, there was a lot that went on during that time. But it all began with this entry into Jerusalem when our king came to town. And, and so uh, the thing to keep in, the mind, in our mind here that makes us just extra special is that Jesus, as he rode that donkey into town, knew exactly what lied ahead of him. He knew what he was going into, and he knew what they were going to do to him. But he went anyway. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. He went to town anyway, knowing what was about to happen. Yeah. You see that adoring multitude that was waving the palm branches would soon change to an angry mob waving a fist and demanding his death by crucifixion. But Jesus continued to go into town. And I believe he did it for a couple of reasons. Number one, to fulfill scripture. Uh, John recorded here uh, a part of the verse in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah prophesied that Jesus would come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey 400 years before it ever happened. And this is what he says in Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. I'm going to tell you something. Every prophecy of God is true. And every prophecy of God has already happened or it's going to happen. And you can take that to the bank, okay? Yeah, yeah. But number two, the second reason Jesus rode into Jerusalem knowing full well what was about to happen, but he knew that he had to do it to buy our salvation listen folks sin demands a payment you think you can just do anything that you want to and nothing's going to happen sin demands a payment and the bible says that all sin is going to be paid for did you know you have a choice to make you can pay for your own sins or you can allow jesus to do it and the payment that you will make for your own sins is eternity separated from the love of God in a place called the lake of fire, suffering eternal torment day and night with no relief. Right. And so Jesus knew that he had to come into town and go through this process of being the sacrificial lamb to buy our salvation because without it, we'd be doomed to hell. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And so sin demanded as its payment, the perfect spotless lamb. Yeah. And you see, there, there had not been none before Jesus, okay? The blood of bulls and goats would not satisfy. And, and so Jesus came, born of a virgin, uh, lived a sinless life, even though the Bible says he was tempted in all points, just like we are, yet he did not sin. And he boldly, and listen to me, willingly, went to the altar and laid down his life for you and me. Yeah. Woo, folks, that's special right there. That's amazing right there. Jesus supplied the necessary sacrifice that bought our atonement, and he is the only way of salvation. Yeah. The only way, not just one way or a good way or the best way. He's the only way. Acts 4 verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus, folks. <clears throat> Our eternal salvation hinged on whether Jesus would enter into Jerusalem or not. So the day that the king rode into town, that determined uh, our chance to be saved right there. Yeah. Some asked, well, when Jesus rode into town and looking now at what happened to him, do you consider it a, a triumphal entry or a tragic entry? <laughs> I guess it depends on whether you're lost or saved, okay? 
If you're lost today and, and you read the story of Jesus coming into, into Jerusalem, uh, from a human standpoint, yeah, it looks like a tragedy, doesn't it? He rode in to celebrate the Passover feast, but during that time he was falsely accused and arrested and, and convicted to death. He was scourged and beaten almost to death. He was humiliated and abused. He was led up Calvary's hill, carried his own cross, and he was nailed to that cross and hung there naked, suffering for six hours before he finally succumbed to a horrible and barbaric death. Yeah, that sounds tragic, doesn't it? From a physical standpoint, that's one of the saddest and most disturbing tragedies of all time. But praise God, we can look at it this morning through the spiritual eyes that God has opened up for us and we can see this as the greatest act of love and purpose ever displayed Amen. on the face of this earth. Amen. Woo! So it was definitely a triumphal entry, wasn't it? And that's why we call it that, the triumphal entry of Jesus as he rode on, on the donkey, as the king came to town. As he rode the donkey into the city to celebrate the Passover and to become the Passover lamb, for all mankind, he came there with a purpose to be sacrificed for our sins. And so now as we're going over in our minds and we're looking at the celebration and we're hearing the crowd and everything, the atmosphere that surrounded his entry into Jerusalem, uh, I want us to look at some things uh, that's going on at that time and see how it relates to us and what it really means, okay? Number one, look at the celebration. The celebration that was going on. The Bible says here, John records that when the news got out that Jesus was coming, people got excited. I wish the church would get excited about Jesus today. Man. Because we seem to have taken him for granted a lot. It, it all becomes about, about us. It becomes a we put all of our focus on the building and the programs and, and all the things that we need and we do and things like that. Folks, it's all about Jesus, and we need to get excited about him today. These folks got excited when they heard the news that Jesus was coming and the street was full and packed out like a parade and they were waving palm branches. They were celebrating the arrival of Jesus Christ. Man. Now, they were waving palm branches. We call this Palm Sunday. What's the significance of that? You know, the, the, the palm branch here on, on as they were about to celebrate Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread was kind of out of place. The palm branch was, was used as they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. And so what was the reason for them to wave in the palm branches here as Jesus was coming into town? Well, the meaning of it is <coughs> waving of a palm branch was a sign of power and victory over your enemies. So you can picture a king coming back from battle, being victorious in his campaign, and the people would welcome him home by waving the palm branches as a sign of that victory. <clears throat> the Jewish people of the days of Jesus, they were suffering tremendously under Roman occupation. They had it bad, I'll tell you. They undoubtedly had been praying for God to, to relieve them of that and to, to save them from that and give them a way out for God to provide a leader that would get them out from under the Roman occupation. You know, these people had saw the miracles of Jesus. They had witnessed the power of God working through him, and they thought, yeah, this is him. He's the one that's going to deliver us from this Roman occupation. And so they were waving these palm branches and shouting Hosanna, signifying that they were looking at Jesus for their victorious king. Yeah. And it was true, but they were looking at him in the wrong way. In their minds, they wanted Jesus to be king and to free them from the Romans. In their minds, while they were shouting Hosanna and waving these palm branches, they were looking for the day when they gained their physical freedom. But Jesus came for a different reason. He came to deliver us spiritually and to give us spiritual, eternal freedom. 
It was a little different than what they had anticipated. He came to set us free from an enemy, all right, but the enemy was sin. And so their desire was a temporary one. Give us relief right here, right now. But the freedom that Jesus came to bring them was an eternal freedom. And I believe this is one of the reasons why they were so eager to, to change all of a sudden and cry out, crucify him, and because they saw Jesus come into town. They saw him arrested. They saw him beaten, and he refused to fight back. He refused to even speak to his accusers, and they saw him now, and they took that as weakness and said, this is not him. This is not the leader that we were looking for. He's not the Messiah that we had anticipated. And so they, they cried out, crucify him. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how people change so quickly? How the opinion of the crowd can change? I mean, one day they were waving palm branches and, and, and shouting Hosanna, praise the Lord. And, and, and just a few short days later, those same hands were clenched in a fist and they were crying out, crucify him and demanding the death of Jesus Christ before Pontius Pilate, the very Roman leader that they wanted Jesus to save them from. Yeah. Wow. The opinion of the crowd can change. But listen, folks, we don't follow the crowd. Yeah. We follow Jesus. Yeah. You know, we can have the palm branches today and wave them because he is our king. Amen. Right. He is our Lord and Savior. He has won the victory over sin, death, and hell, and the grave, and, and we're victorious through him. So wave those palm branches in your heart today because the king rode into town, a victorious king, and he bought our freedom. Yeah. Now let's look at that, the act of transportation. We saw the celebration. Now let's look at the transportation, the donkey that Jesus rode on. And I'm going to tell you something. This going and getting the donkey was one of the the greatest miracles I think that we overlook today. We just kind of skim over that fact. Well, Jesus sent a couple of disciples over there to get a donkey and they brought him back and we don't put much stock in it. But listen, this speaks volumes to me because it tells me when God sends me to do something that doesn't make sense, I can trust that he's already worked it out on the other end. Listen to Matthew 21, the first three verses of that chapter. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied in a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught to thee, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. Wow. Yeah. You, you see the miracle here? that these two disciples had to just step out on blind faith? Jesus says, go, go get this donkey for me. And if anybody stops you and asks you a question, this is what you do. Say, the Lord has need of him. Right. And I often wonder how many, how many times do we talk ourselves out of being obedient to the Lord because it doesn't make sense to us? <laughs> we can't see what's supposed to happen. And, and how many blessings do we miss out on because we think we've got to figure it all out before we obey? Yeah. Jesus said, do this. They did it. And it all worked out exactly like he said. Yeah. And that's what we can hold true to today. We can hold fast to that today. That if we'll do things the way Jesus tells us to do them, they're all going to work out. We don't have to figure it out. Matter of fact, in Mark 11, verse 5, it says they did stop them. They said, hey, where are you going with that donkey? I'm paraphrasing here. But where are you going with that donkey? Why are you untying them and, and leaving with them? That's mine. Right. And they turned and said, the Lord has need of him. And they let him go. God had it worked out on the other end already, didn't he? Man. When we do things the way Jesus says to do them, they're all going to work out. And this is amazing, an amazing miracle, I believe, that teaches us so much today about how we serve the Lord. And just a couple of days after that, he did the same thing with the getting ready to go to the upper room to celebrate the Passover. Go find this room and tell the, the man of the house to get it ready, for I'm coming to celebrate Passover. And they did. Right. Isn't God amazing? Yeah. God is incredible. 
And we see this in the Bible and we read it and we say, Woo, hallelujah, God is amazing. But then why don't we trust Him like that today? Yeah. With everything in our life. So now Jesus is riding and the king is coming into town and he's riding on a donkey and we ask ourselves, why a donkey? You know, I look at, if I was coming into town, I'd have a big white stallion all decorated out like a parade was going on and, and I'd ride into the city in style. But Jesus came and rode on a donkey because the donkey had symbolism that the people there were going to understand. And number one, he rode a donkey, first of all, as we've already said, to fulfill scriptures. Zechariah 9, 9 said he was going to. And every word of God is true. And, and if you ever are confronted with having to believe science or history or anything like that compared to the Bible, always side with God's word because it's always true. And, and the second reason, the donkey symbolized peace. You know, the donkey was just an animal, a burden, a servant type animal, an animal that, that uh, symbolized suffering and peace. And, and when a king would ride into a town on a donkey, it meant he was coming in peace. Right. And that's what Jesus, he was coming into Jerusalem in peace to offer himself willingly as a sacrifice for our sins. Now, when he comes back in the book of Revelation, we see he's riding on a horse, okay, because he's coming back as a conquering king, man. He's coming back for war, but now he's coming in peace, so he's riding a donkey. And, and the third reason he rode a donkey, I believe, is so he could relate to all the common people that were there. Yeah. Did you know Jesus came to die for everybody? All of you watching online here today, Jesus died for you. His salvation knows no barriers. He crosses racial lines. He crosses skin color, languages spoken, places. It doesn't matter. Jesus came and died for every man, woman, boy, and girl, past, present, and future. Yeah. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We all are whosoever's, okay? So Jesus died for the common people, and he wanted that to be known, I believe, in his effort uh, as he came into the city riding on this donkey. So we see the celebration, the waving of the palm branches and the shouting of the Hosanna, the, the transportation, the riding on the donkey. Uh, it, all was, it all meant something, okay? In the 19th century, uh, Chancellor Bismarck of Prussia rode into Jerusalem on a grand white stallion decked out. He had a great crowd celebrating coming into the city with him. And they said the crowd was so big that they had to temporarily move part of the wall to get them all coming into the city. But I'm going to tell you what, as grand as that was, it did not compare with how Jesus came into the city, riding on a lowly donkey, okay? Uh, that's the celebration, that's the transportation, but as always, unfortunately, let's look at the abomination that took place as well because our king rode into town. The religious leaders, uh, they, were, they were fit to be tied. They were about to blow a gasket because of Jesus, okay? And, and they were just consumed with jealousy because of how the people were following after Jesus. Look there in verse 19. They said, behold, the world is gone after him. And that hurt them. That, they, were, they were scared because... They were losing the power and the grip that they had on people. You see, to them, religion was all about what they could get out of it. Man. And that's what religion is. Religion will send you to hell because you're relying on what you can get out of stuff. And it has nothing to do with serving the living God. And so, the abomination. In, in the New Testament, when the Greek word uh, that is translated abomination is used, the meaning is idolatry. And that's what abomination is. It's idolatry. Those men who were leaders of the Jewish religion and their worship, they knew the scriptures, okay? Yep. That wasn't the problem. They knew what the word of God says, and they should have been able to look at the word and the prophecies of God 
and see that Jesus met every requirement of what the Messiah was to bo supposed to be like. But their eyes were blinded because of idolatry. They couldn't see the truth because idolatry had reigned supreme in their hearts and their eyes were blinded to the truth. And, and we look at that and we say, wow, that was terrible. But do you listen to me? Idolatry, the threat of idolatry is just as real today as it has ever been. Yes. And you may say, well, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't worship an idol. You may be worshiping an, an idol and not even realize it because they come in all different shapes and sizes. You know, in the, in the Bible, we read about people carving wooden images out and bowing down and worshiping them or making a golden image and worshiping them. But idols come in all different shapes and sizes, folks. Money may be your God that you're worshiping today. It may be possessions. You're trying to, trying to get everything you can to make your life happy, you think. It may be your hobbies, your recreation. It may be your career. It may be family, whatever it might be. It may even be yourself that you're worshiping today. That's what you put all your focus and attention into. Be careful. Because God can remove those idols out of our lives and get our attention. I want to read a paragraph to you that was written. It was published in Today in the Word, a, a religious publication back in June of 1989. It says, Though we do not face a pantheon of false gods like the Israelites did, we face pressure, pressures from a pantheon of false values, materialism, love of leisure, sensuality, worship of self, security, and many others. The second commandment deals with idols. This may be something that most of us can't relate to unless we include life goals that revolve around something other than God himself. What is the object of our affections, our efforts, and our attention? Where does the majority of our time go? On what do we spend the greatest amount of our resources? And so, you know, even though that article was written so many years ago, he hits the nail right on the head. For most people, we can find out where their loyalty lies by looking at your checkbook and your date book Man. and see what has your attention. Folks, listen, nearly 2,000 years ago, our king rode into town and he entered with a huge celebration riding on a lowly donkey and he was turned against by the religious leaders and thank God today though that we have this, this day to celebrate his triumphal entry. It was, it was definitely a triumph, wasn't it? Yeah. When Jesus went into town because he laid down his life for you and me. Man. Where would we be without that? I'll tell you where we'd be on the fast track to hell where every one of us would be. I, I I want, I want to talk to you this morning because I know a lot of you, I, I don't know who you are. I've mentioned this before. There's a lot of people that, that listen to the services online that I don't know your spiritual condition or anything else about you. But I want you to know this, that Jesus loves you. And if you've never called on him to be your Lord and Savior, I pray for his convicting power to shake you up right now that he will get a hold of you and, and cause you to realize that you are a sinner in sight of a righteous God yeah. and you need to call upon Jesus to be saved today. So listen, I'm going to do a little bit, something a little bit different. I want you, I'm talking to you, and, and listen, you may be confused and kind of doubting. I talk to a lot of people that doubt their salvation, that something happens and they wonder, well, am I really saved? I always tell them it's better to ask again and make sure, okay? Yeah. It doesn't hurt to ask twice, okay? So right there, right where you are, if the Lord's leading you here, here's what you do. You pray a prayer right now. And, and, and you can pray something like this. You don't have to copy me word for word, but you pray from your heart and you mean what you're saying, but you, you just bow your head and say, Lord, I know I've sinned against you. And Lord, I know I've broken your heart and I'm sorry for that. And God, I turn from that lifestyle, I repent of that sin, and I surrender all to you right here, right now today. And I ask you, Lord, to come into my life and save me and use me in Jesus' name. And if you prayed that prayer, you know what? 
Jesus will come into your life and he'll save you and he'll change you and you'll never be the same, okay? Yeah. And, and if you prayed that prayer here, do me a favor, drop us a message because I want to get in touch with you and get you started out on the right foot, hopefully, and, and, and cause you to continue to grow. This is the first step. This isn't it. This is the first step in your journey of service in the Lord. But folks, our whole life should be centered around Jesus. Everything that we do, everything that we say should be focused on bringing glory to Jesus. Yeah. Our king rode into town one day so that we would not have to be separated from him for all of eternity. Because our king came into town one day, I can spend eternity in heaven in the, in the, before the throne of God one day and be there forever and ever. Folks, I don't deserve that. You don't deserve that. But the king made sure we could have that Amen. when he rode into town. So this Palm Sunday, wave your palm branches in your mind, in your heart. Give our king uh, uh, praise and glory for his victory that he won over death, hell, and the grave. And receive him into your heart today before it's too late. Folks, listen, next time we get together tonight, we're going to look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because next Sunday is when we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So if he's willing and we're all still here, we're going to celebrate that next week. But folks, we need to understand what Jesus did for us. Yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And everything that Jesus went through, and we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight, everything he went through it willingly because he saw each and every one of us down through history, and he loves us so much. Yeah. Wow. He deserves our praise, doesn't he? He deserves our worship today. So let's give it to him. Praise his name. Thank you, Jesus, for this Sunday, this Palm Sunday, and the reason that we celebrate as you came into town one day to buy our freedom from sin. God bless you. Let's close in a word of prayer, if you will. Father, I just praise your holy name again, Lord. I just thank you so much for this, this way that we can get the word out today. It may not be the way we've always done it, but we're so appreciative of it, God. And we know that, the, that your word says that your, your word will not return to us void. And so we send it out, God, praying that souls will be saved and lives will be changed and, and our minds will just be taken back to that day when our king did ride into town victorious. And the price that he paid and the debt that was settled because of that. Thank you, Lord, for your spotless lamb that took my sins upon himself and paid the penalty. And God, I pray for everyone listening today that you would just, just cause them to to draw closer to you in everything that they do and say, and that we'll just uplift you in this world of darkness. God, let us shine that light that this world needs to see, and we'll praise you today. Thank you so much again in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll look at you or talk to you. I'm not look at you, but we'll see you tonight at 530. God bless. <laughs>